وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله الذي شرح صدور أوليائه بالإيمان وفتح لهم أبواب النصوص بقواعد البيان وصلى الله وسلم على من أنزل الله عليه الكتاب والميزان وعلى آله وصحابته ومن تبعهم بإحسان أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى today we're going to start the explanation of the book الأصول من علم الأصول written by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymin this book it deals with a subject called Usul al-Fiqh and in the past we have taught books that discuss this science, that talk about this science. We have taught the Kitab Risalatul Latifah many years back. We also taught the Kitab Al Waraqat. And we've also taught other books of Usul al Fiqh that weren't recorded. Today we are going to start this book, Al Usul Min Ilm al Usul, by Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salah al Uthaymin, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. But before I go into the book, I want to mention and talk about five important things. The first thing is, from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon his creation, is that he has sent on us, and that he has sent on his creation, shari'atan muhiitatan bi jami'i ahkam al-hawadithi bayanan wa idaha. That Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He sent on the creation rulings. Those rulings that clarify everything that is from the mercy of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala upon His creation. That there is nothing that this Ummah and these slaves of Allah are in need of except Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He has brought. And he has sent down, subhanahu wa ta'ala, clarity regarding it. And ولذلك, the poet, he said, مَنْ اِهْتَدَى بِهَدِّهِ فَقَدْ ضَفِرْ وَمَنْ يَحِدْ عَنْ نَهْجِهِ فَقَدْ خَسِرْ تُلْفِي بِهِ إِلَى الْفَلَاحِ مَنْ هَجَى وَعَنْ جَمِيعِ الْمُعْضِلَاتِ مَخْرَجَى فَلَيْسَ خَيْرٌ قَطٌ إِلَّا قَرَّرَى وَلَمْ يَكُنْ مِنْ شَرٍ إِلَّا حَذَّرَى فَدِينُنَا لَمْ يَخُلُّ عَن لأنه قد احتوى قواعدا تستخرج الأحكام عنها راشدا. This Quran, the Sunnah that we have, it has the res- the answers for every single thing that we need. So our Sharia, our religion, it is محيطة بجميع أحكام الحوادث بيانا وإضاحة شاملة لكل الوقاء إقامة وإصلاحا. It's the only thing that can perfect the situation of the creation. The second point that I want to mention is our Sharia Every single thing that's, that's going to happen, that will happen, that has happened, our Sharia hasn't given rulings for each and every one of them individually. It doesn't do it in that way, nor has it ever done it in that way. And this is Ittifaq al usuliyin and the scholars of Usul al-Fiqh are unanimously in agreement that that isn't the case. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has done it in principles, qawaid, legal maxims in which people can go back to and use them and not everybody is able to do that that is specific to the mujtahideen the scholars who have reached ijtihad and we'll speak about what that means inshallah ta'ala the third point that i want to speak about inshallah ta'ala is a person is not able to Understand these rulings Allah has sent down subhanahu wa ta'ala. These rulings 
which is connected to our salvation and our prosperity. These rulings, a person will not be able to come to understand it and comprehend it in a correct manner unless he studies and he learns this subject, usul al-fiqh. The person has to learn manahij al-istidlal wa turuq al-istinbat how to extract rulings. And inshallah ta'ala, later we're going to speak about the two pillars in which istimbat stands on. The two pillars in which al-istimbat stands on. The fourth point that I want to mention inshallah ta'ala is the real meaning of fiqh. The real meaning of fiqh is knowing adillatul sharia knowing what are the evidence that the sharia stands on and the evidence which the sharia stands on is al kitab the book of allah was sunnah the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam wal ijma the consensus of the early generation and the fourth one is al qiyas sahih the correct analogy Also, the person has to understand Dalalatul Al-Fad, the terms that are used in the Quran and the terms that are used in the Sunnah. What do they mean? When do they show generalization? When do they show specification? When, they, when are they abrogated? How are they abrogated? Etc. When is it unrestricted? And when is it restricted? Dalalatul Al-Fad, the indication that are in these words. The meaning that are in these words. The fifth point that I want to speak about, inshallah ta'ala, is the importance, or more like the benefits and the unique things that are present in this book written by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymin al Usul min ilm al Usul, and why we chose to cover this book. This book. Al-Usul min ilm al-Usul is a very important book and it really has unique things that a person may not even find in the mutawwalat, the big books. And we'll speak about the big books in Usul al-Fiqh soon, inshallah ta'ala. Shaykh ibn Uthaymin's kitab, it has and is unique from other books it is unique in in two things. It has two unique things over the other books in Usul al Fiqh. Number one, Kathratul Amthilatul Fiqhiyah. The Shaykh mentions many fiqh examples. He mentions it, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And that is a benefit for a student of knowledge. Because Usul al Fiqh is a lot of theories. And these theories are hard to be comprehended and understood if examples aren't given. And Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen, he gives a lot of examples, rahimahullah ta'ala. And he builds these principles upon those furu' al fiqhiyya those sub-branches. He shows you the way that this qa'idah works and how it's applied. It's the first benefit. The second is Diqqatul Ibarah. The way that the Shaykh chose the terms that he's going to use in his book. Diqqatul Ibarah. And how he, the Shaykh did Tahrir. He chose, he thought about what term would he want to use for this book. And he also observed using terms that are easy. The early books in Usul al-Fiqh, when you read them, the terms are very hard. And so the person may not even understand what the author is trying to say. But the Shaykh here, he chose words that are accurate in terms of what he's talking about. And we're going to give examples of that inshallah ta'ala. And also the author, rahimahullah, he chose to use Ibarat which are sahla and wadha. Very easy and very clear. 
rahimahullah. And those two that I just mentioned right now, qallama yajtami'ani fi matnin min mutun al-usuliya. Rare are you going to find these two present in an usul al-fiqh book. But Allah honored the Shaykh to uh, have that in his book. Now I want to go into the author of this book. Who is he? The author of this book, his name is Muhammad ibn Salih. Muhammad ibn Salih ibn Muhammad al Uthaymin. The Shaykh rahimahullah is from a tribe called Uthaymin, originally from Bani Tamim. The Shaykh was born when the year was 1347. And he was born in a place called Uleyza in Qasim. And the Shaykh rahimahullah, he grew nash'a ilmiyya mundu nu'umati adfari. As a young child, he grew up, rahimahullah ta'ala, in a Islamic household where knowledge was honored and people gave importance to learning the Quran and the Sunnah. His father placed him under the supervision of his granddad from his mother's side, his maternal granddad, whose name was Abdurrahman ibn, Abdurrahman ibn Sulaiman al-Damigh, who taught him the Quran. And the Shaykh, rahimahullah, he learned how to write, he learned how to read, he learned the basics of maths, he memorized the Quran, and he did all of this before he reached the age of 11. Then the Shaykh, rahimahullah, he embarked on the path of seeking knowledge. And as you can see, brothers and sisters who are listening, the author, rahimahullah, he embarked on seeking knowledge after he'd memorized the Quran. We said that he finished the Quran and then we said he embarked on seeking knowledge. Because a person should memorize the Quran whether he or she is seeking knowledge. That should be something that every Muslim does. So the Shaykh, he embarked on the path of seeking knowledge. And he sat down in the gathering of Alamatul Qasim, the scholar of Qasim. Of that time, Shaykh Abdul Rahman ibn Nasir al Sidi. And the Shaykh Rahimahullah, he studied with him tafsir, hadith, tawheed, fiqh, usul, fara'id, and nahu. And the Shaykh Rahimahullah, he memorized Mukhtasarat al Mutun in these sciences. The Shaykh memorized it. So he memorized books in Tawheed and Fiqh and Usul and Fara'id and Nahu. ولذلك the Shaykh himself, he said about himself, he said, قَرَأْنَا كَثِيرًا وَحَفِظْنَا قَلِيلًا He said, we read a lot. And we memorized little, فَاسْتَفَذْنَا We benefited from. فَاسْتَفَذْنَا فَاسْتَفَذْنَا بِمَا حَفِظْنَا We benefited from that which we memorized than that which we read. And that shows you the importance of memorizing and how memorization is really where knowledge lies. A person, if they give time to memorizing and they place knowledge in their heart, they will realize that that is what, that, with, that is what they can claim. That is the knowledge which you can claim. That is the knowledge you really own. As for what is inside books and that which you read, then that's a knowledge shared by everybody. That is not unique to you. That is not unique to you. Everyone can open that book and read it with you. So the Sheikh, he memorized Mukhtasarat in those sciences. And Sheikh Abdurrahman Nasir al-Su'idi is considered to be from the first teachers or the first teacher of Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymin. And the Shaykh, he took from him two important lessons when it came to knowledge. The first thing he took, f- and he benefited greatly from, especially if you ponder on Shaykh ibn Uthaymin, is Ittiba' al Dalil. Shaykh ibn Uthaymin really benefited from his teacher, Abdurrahman Nasir al Saudi, the importance of following evidence, meaning the Quran and the Sunnah. And the second thing that he truly benefited from his teacher was how to teach. The method and the way to teach. 
And Sheikh got affected by his teacher in that two regards. When the year was 1372, uh, the Sheikh he went to and he enrolled into Al Ma'had Al Ilmi in Riyadh. At that time, they just opened the, uh, the Ma'had Al Ilmi in uh, Al Riyadh, the Institute of Knowledge. They just opened it and the Sheikh enrolled. Rahimahullah. And when he went there, one of the teachers that were teaching was Sheikh Muhammad Al Amin Al Shanqiti. Al Usuri Al Mufassir, the great Usuri and the great Mufassir, the author of the Kitab Al Al Adwa Al Bayan fi Idah Al Quran Bil Quran. He has a Kitab called Mudakira fi Usul Al Fiqh, and he also has um, another Tafsir book which is called Adbu Al Namir, and he also has Rihla to Ila Bayti Allah Al Haram and many other books, and he has a Sharah. On the Kitab Maraq al Su'ud li Mubtaghi al Ruqiyya wa al Su'ud. Rahimahullah. Sheikh Muhammad al Amin al Shaqiyati was his teacher that he took knowledge from in the Ma'had al Ilmi in Riyadh. Also, he studied from the Sheikh al Faqih, Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Nasir al Rashid. And Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Nasir al Rashid, he was one of the Fuqaha and the Qudats in Riyadh at that time. And Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin took from him. And this Sheikh, his Sharah of Aqidatul Wasitiyya is considered to be the best Sharah of Aqidatul Wasitiyya. It's called Al Tambihat Al Saniyya. Fi Sharh Aqidatul Wasitiyya. It's the best explanation placed on Aqidatul Wasitiyya. At this time, the Sheikh Rahimahullah Ta'ala, whilst he was in Riyadh, and taking knowledge from these scholars, he built a relationship with Al Allama, Al Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Abdullah ibn Baz. He built a relationship with him. And he benefited from him, Ilmul Hadith. And he also benefited from him how to look into the opinions of the Fuqaha. Another of the Ara'il Fuqaha. Sheikh ibn Baz was very strong in this. How to choose which view is stronger than which. Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin benefited that from Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ibn Abdullah Ibn Baz. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And when the year was 1374, one year later, the Sheikh he came back to his city, Uneza. He came back and he came back to study from his teacher, Al Sheikh Abdul Rahman Ibn Nasir Al Saudi. He came to benefit from him. And he carried on. He's studying, his formal studying in Kulita Sharia in Qasim. There was a branch that was opened in Qasim. So he didn't have to stay in Riyadh anymore. He didn't have to stay in Riyadh anymore. He could actually study in Qasim, but that was connected to Riyadh. So he was getting recognized from the, uh, the branch in Riyadh. Then the Sheikh Rahimahullah, that same year, he was selected and he was chosen to teach in the Ma'had al-Ilmi in Unayza that was opened. He was selected and he was chosen to teach there. And he taught, Rahimahullah, um, until the year he passed away, Rahimahullah. He was a teacher teaching there in the, the Ma'had al-Ilmi um, or Tadris bi kulli tishari'ati usuli deen in Qasim. He was teaching, teaching until he died, rahimahullah. He also used to teach. He also used to teach in Al Masjid al Haram and Masjid al Nabawi. But he used to teach at the Mawasim al Hajj and Shah Ramadan. So he used to teach in the seasonal uh, times and the season, seasonal periods, such as Hajj time and Ramadan time, and he will also teach at Utal al-Sayfiyya, the summer holidays. He would teach Rahimahullah, and this started for him at the year 1402. This is when he started to teach in the Haram until he died Rahimahullah Ta'ala. The Shaykh Rahimahullah, he took positions. There were positions that he took. From the positions that he took was, he was chosen to be the head of 
الجمعية الخيرية لتحفيظ القرآن الكريم in Unayza. And that was the year 1405. He was selected to be part of the society of memorizing the Quran. He was also chosen to be a Udwan fi Hayati Kibar al Ulama in Mamlakat al Arabi Saudiya. He was chosen to be from the committee of senior scholars. And this was uh, the year 1407. He was also uh, given the Nobel Prize, Jaizatul uh, Malik Faisal. Al Alamiya, when the year was 1414, under the title of Khidmatul Islam, serving Islam and how he served the religion. The Shaykh Rahimullah exerted a lot of effort in teaching and he sat down to teach in Al Jami'ul Kabir in Unayza. And it's still, until today, it's still there. And students came to him, Rahimullah Ta'ala. من المشارق والمغارب. The people came from the east and the west, and they benefited from him. أي منتفع. Greatly they benefited from him, and the reason why they benefited from him was because the Sheikh had uslub fad. He had a method and a way that was profound in making knowledge so easy for the people and bringing science to the people's attention and being able to break down complicated matters and simplifying it. He was able to do that, rahimahullah ta'ala. The Shaykh, rahimahullah, has many books. From the books that he has is a kitab called Al-Sharh Al-Mumti' Ala Zad Al-Mustaqni'. The Shaykh, rahimahullah, he explained the kitab Zad Al-Mustaqni' written by Musa ibn Ahmed Al-Hajjawi, rahimahullah. Musa Al-Hajjawi, Rahimahullah, his book, he died the year 967 uh, Hijriya. The Shaykh Rahimahullah, he explained his book. And this kitab, Zad Al Mustaqni, is a summary of the kitab Al Muqni' by Muwafaquddin. Al Muwafaquddin ibn Qudama, Rahimahullah, he has great books of fiqh in the Hanbali Madhab. And Yahya al Sarsari summarized them as Ibn Rajab mentions. Them in the kitab Dailu Tabakat al Hanabila, Kafal Kalki Bil Kafi Wakna al Taliban, Bimukni Ifikin and Kitabin Mutawali, Wagna Bimugni Il Fiki Mankana Bahithan, Wamdatu Manya Tamidha Yu Hassili, Warodatu Datul Usuri Karodatin, Amaset Bihel Azharu and Fasa Sham Ali, Tadulu Alan Montuki Ofa Delalatin, Watah Milu Filmafumi Ahsana Mahmadi. So the Kitab al Mukni. By Ibn Qudama, Musa ibn Ahmad al-Hajjawi, he summarized it in the kitab Zad al-Mustaqni'. And this kitab Zad al-Mustaqni' is the five of the fifth of the Hanbali books that a student of knowledge needs to start with. The person who's studying the Hanbali madhab, he or she should give time to studying the madhab in a gradual way, because the Shaykh Rahimahullah ibn Uthaymin and other scholars, they always took knowledge in a gradual way. They never jumped to big books if they haven't studied the book before that. And the first book that the scholars prescribe for a person who's studying the Hanbali madhab is Akhsar al-Mukhtasarat. Akhsar al-Mukhtasarat is written by Muhammad ibn Badruddin Balliban Rahimahullah, who died a year. 1083 Hijriya. 1083 Hijriya. His kitab is what you start with. It's called Akhsar al Mukhtasarat. And there's many shuruhat that are being placed on it. One of the shuruh that is being placed on it, which is good, is Kashful Muqaddarat, written by Abdul Rahman ibn Abdullah ibn Ba'ali, Abdul Rahman ibn Abdullah al Ba'ali. Al-Hanbali, rahimahullah, which is Sharah, which is one volumes. Nasir al-Ajmi, he done a tahqiq on it, on Thalathat Nusakh Khattiyah, which is very good. The second book that a student of knowledge needs to do is Umdatu Talib. The second book a student of knowledge should look into is Umdatu Talib by Mansur al-Buhuti. Mansur al-Buhuti, 
is called Sharih al Madhab. And he died in the year 1051 Hijriya. And he's called Sharih al Madhab, meaning he's the explainer of the Madhab. He even has a Sharah on the Zad al Mustaqni. He called it Rawd al Murbi'. And the Sharah is very good. Also, the second book is Dalil al Talib, which is written by Muhammad, uh, sorry, Mar'i al Karami. He wrote it, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, who died the year 1033 Hijriya. The third, the fourth book is that a student of knowledge in the Hanbali Madhab should do is Kafi al Mubtadi. Written by, again, Muhammad ibn Badruddin ibn Balliban, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And last but not least is the Kitab Zad al Mustaqni by uh, Musa ibn Ahmad al Hajjawi, who died the year. 967 Hijriya. The student of knowledge, he needs to memorize them in this order. The student should memorize the Zad first. If he's a Hanbali, he should try to memorize the Zad al Mustaqni'. If he's unable to memorize the Zad al Mustaqni', then he goes for the Dalil al Talib. He can then go for the Dalil al Talib by Mar' al Karami. That's the second book he should do. If he's not able to, then he should do the Aqsar al Mukhtasarat. If he's not able to, then he should go for the Umda to Talib by Mansur al Buhuti. And then, if not, then he can go for the Kafir Mubtali by Muhammad Badruddin ibn Balliban. And a poet, he summarized that all together and he said, Azadu wa Dalilu thum al Aksaru, wa al Umda to al Kafi fahadi tundaru, ma hivdi matni wahidi minha wa tam, tartibuha fi hivdiha al al Aham. Student of knowledge should memorize it in that order. الزاد والدليل الزاد والدليل ثم الأخصر وعمدة الكافي فهذه تنظر So those are the four I mean those are the five الزاد والدليل The person should go for the Zad If he memorizes the Zad المستقنع and he does that that's the best one amazing he can't do it then he should go for the دليل 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 الطالب If he can't then he goes for the أخصر المخصصرات by محمد Ibn Badruddin, Ibn Balliban. If he then can't do it, then he does the Umda. Umda to Talib. Umda to Talib, he does that. By Masur al Buhuti. And if he can't, then he goes for the Kafi. And I mentioned that lines of poetry in which he could look into it. Al Zadu wa Dalilu, Al Zadu wa Dalilu, Thumma al Aksaru. Wa Umda to Kafi, Fahadi Tundaru. Ma Hivdi Matlin Wahidin. منها وتم ترتيبها على ترتيبها في حفظها على الأهم. So the Sheikh رحمه الله explained the كتاب شرح زاد المستقنع and the كتاب شرح الممتع and it's one of the greatest شروحات of the book. And the reason why this شرح is one of the greatest شروح is because دقة الاستنباط. شرح الثي means deep observation and how it extracts things is there. And his Jodah to Listidlal. How beautiful he uses evidences. And also, Rahimahullah, he applied a lot of Qawaid and Usul al Fiqh in there. Qawaid al Usuliya and Qawaid al Fiqhiya in there. Which gave that book a very great status. The second thing that the Shaykh authored is Tasheel al Fara'id. He wrote a book where he wanted to simplify inheritance, which truly is a book that the inheritance was, sub- was, sub- was simplified. From the books that he wrote is kitab called Madhumat Usul al Fiqh wa Qawa'idu, which we taught but never got recorded. The fourth kitab that he wrote, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, is Ahkamu min al Quran al Karim. So the thing is, some of these were books that he wrote and some of them were taken from his tapes. I don't really know which ones were the ones he wrote and those which were taken from his tapes and transcribed from them. The fourth one is Taqrib al Tadmuriya. The sixth one is Al Qawl al Mufid. بشرح كتاب التوحيد. And last but not least, الأصول من علم الأصول. Those are all books that the Sheikh رحمه الله wrote. The Sheikh he died in Jeddah before Maghrib on a Wednesday, and the year was 1421, and he was prayed in Masjid al Haram. He was prayed in Masjid al Haram after Salat al Asri. From when? Yom al-Khamis, the next day. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to 
bestow upon Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al-Utaymin his mercy. And I'll ask Allah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he inherits him and he gives him al-Firdaus al-A'la from his Jannah. And I ask Allah wa ta'ala that he gathers us and all the prophets and the righteous slaves of his in Jannatun Na'im, inna sami'un mujib. Inshallah ta'ala, without any further ado, we're going to be starting the kitab and we're going to, inshallah ta'ala, focus on making it not a detailed explanation, but a simple, inshallah ta'ala, outline of what this author, author is trying to say, rahimahullah ta'ala. The author, rahimahullah, he started by saying, Usul al fiqh ta'rifuhu, Usul al fiqh yu'arrafu bi'atibarayni al-awwalu bi'atibari mufradayhi, أي باعتبار أي باعتبار كلمة أصول وكلمة فقه فالأصول جمع أصل وهو ما يبنى عليه غيره ومن ذلك أصل الجدار وهو أساس وأصل الشجرة الذي يتفرع منها أغصانها الذي يتفرع منه أغصانها قال الله تعالى ألم تر كيف ضرب الله مثلا كلمة طيبة كشجرة طيبة أصلها ثابت وفرعها في السماء والفقه لغة الفهم ومنه قوله تعالى وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أصول الفقه The definition of أصول الفقه is understood in two ways Firstly with regards to the first component أصول and the second فقه أصول is the plural of the word أصل and it means whatever can have something else built upon it From that we have the أصل foundation of a wall which is in essence its base Likewise, the foundation of a tree, which has many branches sprouting from it. As Allah the Most High says, Have you not considered how Allah presents an example, making a good word like a good tree, whose root is firmly fixed and its branches high in the sky? Fiqh linguistically means understanding, as is the case in the statement of Allah the Most High, and untie the knot from my tongue so that they may understand my speech. The author, rahimahullah, he started the book by defining usul al-fiqh. And the reason why the author started the book by uh, defining usul al-fiqh is for two reasons. The first reason why he started the book by defining usul al-fiqh is because you are not able as an individual to go into a science unless you have a perception regarding it. Unless you have perceived that science, unless you have an overall understanding of it. And a person cannot have a perception from something unless it's defined for him. So that's why the author, Rahimahullah, he started by defining. The second reason why the author chose to start with the definition is because when a person comes to know about what they are seeking, when the person knows the reality of what he is seeking, then what becomes little in his eyes is the effort that he exerts. He will not see his efforts to ever be anything. When that science that you're seeking is a science that you now know its reality and what it is, how noble it is and how great it is. All of the hard work and the effort that you put in to try to understand that science will become very little to you. So that is why the author, rahimahullah, he chose to start with defining usul al-fiqh. The author, rahimahullah, he defined usul al-fiqh in two ways. And he mentioned them. He said usul al-fiqh is defined in two ways. The first way is bi'atibari mufradayhi, individually defining it. So you define usul by itself and you define fiqh by itself that's the first way the second way is that you define both of them together bi'atibari kalimati usul al-fiqh wa kalimati fiqh that's the first way and the second way is bi'atibari bi'atibari kawnihi laqaban li hadha al-fan walidhalika poet he said wal mufradu al-mudaf in tarakaba ma'a ghayrihi hatta atamma laqaba fahadduhu yakunu bil ifradi li kulli wahid lada al-nuqadi thumma yu'adu taniyan murakaban idh laqaba al-ladayhimu tarakaba usul al-fiqh is two ways of defining it the first i mentioned it to you is bi'atibari mufradayhi 
you look at each one independently. You look at what usul means and you look at what fiqh means. That's the first way of defining it. And the second way of defining it is you define it together. You define usul al-fiqh together. So let's start with the first way of defining it, which is bi'tibari mufradayhi. Usul and al-fiqh. Usul is the plural of asal. Usul is a plural and it's the, one of the three types of plural in the Arabic language. The plurals in the Arabic language are three types. A feminine plural, masculine plural, and a broken plural. Usul is a broken plural. And the singular for it is asal. What does asal mean? It means وَهُوَ مَا يُبْنَى عَلَيْهِ غَيْرُ It is anything things are built on. Asal is foundation in English. And the foundation is what things are built upon it. And the way that things are built upon it, the scholars they mention, is two types. Things which are tangible and things which are not tangible. So, for example, this building, uh, the foundation, and then on top of it, the building was built upon it. That's tangible. It's something you can touch. It is something you can see. There's another type, which is, is also a asal, and things are built upon it, but you can't touch it, and that is the relationship between a child and his father. The father is the asal, and the son comes from the father. The son was built upon the father. He came from the father, but it's not something you can touch. It's not something you could see. It is there like him. The Shaykh, the he gives one example, which is وَمِن ذَلِكَ أَصْلُ الْجِدَارِ وَهُوَ أَسَاسُ The Shaykh gave the only first type, which is the tangible one. He says that the foundation of a, a wall is the bricks and the foundation. And the asal of the tree is It is where the branches come out from. You see, it's the trunk. Huh? Um, the roots in which the, um, the branches come out from and the leaves come out from. And the author then used the ayah, أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا كَلِمَةً طَيِّبَةً كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ أَصْلُهَا ثَابِتٌ وَفَرْعُهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ He used that verse. Now we know what asal means. Um, the word usul means. We know what it means. It means foundation. What does the word al-fiqh mean? The author said, Al-fiqh, it means al-fahmu. Al-fiqh, what does it mean? Al-fahmu. It means to understand. It means to, it means to understand and to comprehend. Some of the scholars, they said, fiqh cannot be called al-fahmu. Fiqh cannot be called fahmu. Because fiqh is more detailed and it's more of a specific time of comprehension. It's not just any type of... Because al-fahmu means to understand. So for example, you can say, I understood that the sky is above us. You can use the word fahmu in that context. You can say fahimtu. Anna sama' fawqana, that the sky is above us. You're able to say that. But you cannot say faqihtu anna sama' fawqana. The reason is because they said that the word al-fiqh is used for diqqatul fahm. It's used for the uh, of detailed type of knowledge. It's the type of knowledge which requires looking and researching and etc. That's what they said. And the evidence that the author brought for that is Qawluhu ta'ala, the statement of Allah, وَحْلُ الْعُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِ يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي Oh Allah, take out of my tongue knots, meaning make me eloquent in my speech, so that they can understand what I am saying. يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي means a يَفْهَمُ قَوْلِي, that they can understand what I am saying. So the Shaykh, rahimahullah, he has defined the word usul, and he has also defined the word um, 
the word uh, fiqh. The question here is, he's only defined them both linguistically. What is the technical meaning and definition of the word asal? The scholars, they said, the technical usage of the word asal, it's many. It's not one, it's many. Because the word asal, it's used by many scholars of different sciences. And so each science, the word asal has a meaning for them. So the technical definition is very vast. So it's a laft which is mushtarak bayna iddati ma'ani. It's a term which is shared in different meanings. It's shared by um, different scholars of different subjects and different sciences. And even sometimes in one science they use it for many different meanings as well. One of the meanings that the word al-asru has is a dalil It has what? It means a dalil so the word asr sometimes is actually used as the a synonym of the word ad dalil So for example you would say al-asr fi istihbabi kitabat ad dain the evidence that it's recommended to write the debt is in the statement of Allah ya ayyuhal ladina amanu idha tadayantum bi dainin ila ajalin musamman faktubuh So the person says al-asr fi istihbabi Kitabat al that it's recommended, the evidence that it's recommended to write the debt. You didn't say evidence, you used the word asal. Asal here means evidence. Also, for example, to say al aslu fi tahrimi sibabul muslim, the asal of ins- the asal here means what? The evidence that it's prohibited to insult a Muslim is sibabul muslim fusukun wa qitalu kufrun. The statement of the Prophet Sallallahu that insulting a Muslim is fusfisq, it's fusuq, it's transgression, it's disobedience of Allah Azza wa Jalla. But you didn't say the word evidence, you said al-aslu, because the word ev- asl here means evidence. The second is al-rajih, the stronger of two opinions. So sometimes, the word asal is used for the strongest of the opinions. For example, you say al-aslu tam taqdimul mantuqi ala al-mafhumi. The strongest opinion is to give precedence to the direct speech than the indirect speech. Ama al-aslu fi al-kalam al-haqiqa. The asal the strongest opinion is that the speech should be left at its true meaning and not majaz, metaphorical. Al aslu adamul idhmar. The asal, the strongest opinion is that the word isn't hidden, but that it's made apparent. Number three is al qa'idatul mustamirat fi shara. The third meaning that is used technically is the continuous evidence. It's used for what? The conf- sorry, the continuous principle. So it means in some context, al qaidatul mustamiratu fi shara, the continuous principle. It means that. For example, you say al aslu fil ashya al ibaha. The continuous principle is that everything is permissible to be done. You're allowed to do and eat whatever you see. The asal is that everything is permissible until proven otherwise. But you see, why we're saying is al qaidatul al mustamiratu fi shara because there could happen times when that principle is what? It's stopped. Or for example, you will say al aslul amal bil umum. The asal of action is generalization. The Qa'idatul Mustamirra, the continuous principle is that goes all the time is that. I mean, some scholars they call it al istishab in that in that same usage. And a fourth way is al maqisu alayhim. When you look at the four pillars, 
that Qiyas analogy stands on, what was it? The pillars that Qiyas stands on was, number one, was um, Hukum, right? The ruling of something. The second one was Al-Illah. Third one was Al-Asl. The fourth one was Al-Fara'. So let's take Khamar for example. The Khamar is the Asal. The Khamar is the what? Asal. It's the original thing that we're trying to use. We're trying to make an analogy from it. What is it called? Al-Asl. So it's the Al-Maqisu Ali, the thing that you're going to do the Qiyas from. The drugs is the Fara'. It's the sub-branch. The drug is the what? Is the sub-branch. The drug is the sub-branch. What is it that they both have in common? Al-Iskar, they intoxicate. That's the illatun jami'at maynuma, the illa that they both share. Then the hukum is the same. The reason why this was made haram was, was, was what? Al-Iskar. And the illa is also found in here, which is Al-Iskar, then it's haram. Both of them are going to be haram. So those are the four pillars of Qiyas analogy. The first pillar is Al-Aslu. The thing that you want to do the analogy from. And then the al faru the thing that you're going to do the analogy for. And the asal is the thing that you're going to do analogy from. So at that al maqisu alayhi is called asal. That's one of the technical usages as well. And there are many others that I mentioned. Some scholars, they reached it to 10. Some even reached it to 20. You can look for it in other places, insha'Allah ta'ala. So we've taken the word usul lughatan wa stilahan. We have. What about fiqh? Fiqh, we've only taken it lughatan, but we haven't taken it istilahan. Don't worry, the Sheikh is going to bring it himself. The author, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih Uthaymin, is going to bring it. Now. The Sheikh says, وَاصْطِلَاحَ الْمَعْرِفَةُ الْأَحْكَامَ الشَّرْعِيَةِ الْعَمَلِيَةِ بِأَدِلَّةِ التَّفْصِيلِيَةِ فَالْمُرَادُ بِقَوْلِنَا مَعْرِفَةِ الْعِلْمُ وَالظَّنِّ لأن إدراك الأحكام الفقهية قد يكون يقينيا وقد يكون ظنيا كما في كثير من مسائل الفقه والمراد بقولنا الأحكام الشرعية الأحكام المتلقات من الشرع كالوجوب والتحريم فخرج به الأحكام العقلية كمعرفة أن الكل أكبر من الجزء والأحكام العادية كمعرفة نزول الطل في الليلة الشاتية إذا كان الجو صحوا والمراد بقولنا العملية ما لا يتعلق بالاعتقاد كالصلاة والزكاة فخرج به ما يتعلق بالاعتقاد كتوحيد الله ومعرفة أسماء وصفات فلا يسمى ذلك فقا في الاصطلاح والمراد بقولنا بأدلتها التفصيلية أدلة الفقه المقرونة بمسائل الفقه التفصيلية فخرج به أصول الفقه لأن البحث فيه إنما يكون في أدلة الفقه الإجمالية. نعم. And it's used in the science of jurisprudences, knowledge of the rulings of the Sharia, along with their specific evidences. The meaning of the word معرفة is knowledge and conjecture, because rulings of fiqh can be perceived with certainty or speculation, as is the case in many issues of fiqh. The meaning of the words legal rulings, al-ahkam al is rulings derived from the legislation, such as the obligatory or the prohibitive nature of something. So from this is excluded rulings based on intellect, such as the knowledge that the whole of something is always bigger than any individual part. Also general rulings like rain falling during a clear wintry night. The meaning of the word process, al amaliya is whatever is not connected to beliefs, such as the prayer and zakat. So from this we can exclude all those things which are connected with beliefs, such as tawheed and knowing the names and attributes of Allah. So none of these things are called fiqh in jurisprudence. The meaning of the words specific evidences, al-adillah tafsiliyah, is evidences of fiqh that are coupled with detailed matters of fiqh. So from this definition, we can exclude usul of fiqh itself because its scope is limited to the general evidences of fiqh. The author, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions knowing al-ahkam al knowing the legal Islamic jurisprudence. 
العملية بأدلتها التفصيلية. Let's stand over each word that he mentioned. He said معرفة. معرفة is to know. And معرفة under it falls العلم knowledge. والظن speculation. So معرفة under it falls whatever you come to know through knowledge or you come to know it through speculation. So the ahkam of the sharia has two situations. أن يكون قطعية that it becomes clear cut. It is crystal clear, clear cut. Such as knowing that the five prayers, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and Fajr, that they are obligatory. That is qat'iyah, it's clear cut. Knowing that zina is haram, it's clear cut. Are we all together? Number two. Is that which we know through high speculation. And yakuna dhaniyan, it's through high speculation. And the dhani that the, he has, the Sheikh is referring to here is a dhanul ghalib. High speculation. It's not mujarrad dhan. High speculation. Such as is um, intention required in wudu? Does the honey fall under or do you have to pay zakat? Uh, for honey and things like that which the fuqaha differed upon that is based upon that hukum that the scholars would give is based upon dhaniya it's based upon speculation and some things are based upon qat'iyyah clear cut are we all together so that is fiqh that is sorry ma'rifa what it means and the Sheikh said here, لأن إدراك الأحكام أحكام الفقية قد يكون يقينا. It can be certainty, and it can also be وقد يكون ظنيا. And the evidence for the ظني, I mentioned it, is for example what the Fuqaha differed upon, whether the the honey has to be paid zakat from it. Scholars they differed on that. They also differed on what وجوب النية في الوضوء. They differed upon it. But there's an ayah in the Quran in Surah Al-Mumtahina. Allah Taala wa Taala what did He say? Um, Allah says, if they come to you as what? Believing women. If the women who migrated from Mecca, they come to you as believing women, what should you do? Don't turn them back to the disbelievers. Some of the fuqaha and the scholars, they took from this, that to know whether a person is a believer is, all, is based upon high speculation. That high speculation is given consideration without a doubt. It's given, a, it's given consideration, it's accepted. But it's based upon what? It's based upon dhanni, speculation. Because this person could be lying, it could be a munafiq, it could be this, it could be that. There's no certainty there. But we still implement it. We still accept it from that person. Are we all together? So that is what it means, ma'rifa. Uh, then the author said, وَالْمُرَادُ بِقَوْلِنَا What we mean by the word, second term that was used here is الْأَحْكَامُ الشَّرَعِيَّةِ الْأَحْكَامُ الشَّرَعِيَّةِ The word ahkam is plural. And again, it's one of the plurals in the Arabic language known as broken plural. It's a it's a broken plural. And Al-Ahkam is plural and the singular is Hukum. Hukum is a singular. And don't worry, we're going to be talking about that soon in great details, inshallah ta'ala. So we won't go into it now. Like in the Ahkam is divided into four. The Ahkam is divided into how many? Four. The Sheikh mentioned one of the Ahkam and he mentioned it to you, which is Al-Ahkam al That's one of the four. The first one is Ahkam Al-Ahkam Lugawiyya. Ahkam Lugawiyya means uh, language-based rulings. I mean, linguistic rulings. For example, we know that the fa'il is marfu'ah. We know that. We also know that the, Anna al-Isma la yujzam. 
that you cannot place jazm on an ism. We also know in the Arabic language, that you cannot start with a sukun. That's a grammatical ruling. That is a linguistic ruling. Okay. The second one is ahkam aqliya. It's called rational rulings, intellectual rulings, and that is what is benefited from in jihad al aql, from the angle of, from the angle of thinking and um, observing and scrutinizing and looking and observing and using your aql, like for example. Knowing that um, one is half of two. Number three is ahkam adiyya. Ahkam adiyya is rulings that are known from norms and um, it is known from norms. For example, to get something from a high place, you'd have to take a ladder. Okay, if something is on a high place, you take a staircase or you take a ladder to go up there and to bring it down. Number four is ahkam al shariyah. That's why the author restricted it with the term shariyah. That's why the author here, he didn't just say ahkam. Because if he said ahkam, it could be any of the three. So any any of the others, so he restricted it to ahkam shar'iyah. And ahkam shar'iyah is what? Ahkam shar'iyah is two types. Ahkam shar'iyah is how many types? Two types. The first one is al ahkam shar'iyah al ilmiyah, and that's aqidah. Al ahkam shar'iyah al al ilmiyah. Al ahkam shar'iyah al ilmiyah. That's aqidah. And in Aqeedah, what do you learn? You learn the six articles of faith, which is أن تؤمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله واليوم الآخر وتؤمن بالقدر خير وشر. And you also learn what? You also learn al imama and you, the Muslim leader and what not, and things related to that. And you also learn مسائل الصحابة, things related to the Sahaba. And you learn مسمى الإيمان. What does Iman mean? And the reality of al iman. That's ahkam al shar'iyya al ilmiyya. The second type of ahkam al shar'iyya is al ahkam al shar'iyya al amaliyya. Al amaliyya. The author is talking about that one. Are we all together? Lakin like according to the sharia, both of them are fiqh. Al ahkam al shar'iyya al ilmiyya and al ahkam al shar'iyya al amaliyya. According to the Sharia, according to the Quran and the Sunnah, both of them are known as fiqh. That's why when the Prophet said, "Man yuri dillahu bi khayran, yufaqihu fi din," it's not talking about al-hakam al-shar'iyat al-amaliya only. It is also talking about al-hakam al-shar'iyat al-ilmiya. It is talking about that as well. Okay, al-hakam al-shar'iyat al-amaliya, which is fiqh, and not aqidah. الأحكام الشرعية العملية. It also breaks into three. الأحكام الشرعية العملية. It breaks into it breaks into three, or it deals with three things regarding the people's actions. The first one is أقوال العباد. The statements that come from the slave. That's عمل. وأفعال الجوارح and the actions that come from the limbs. And the third one is وَأَعْمَالُ الْقُلُوبِ The internal actions are also أَحْكَامَ الشَّرْعِيَّةَ الْعَمَلِيَّةَ All three of them is what's studied in fiqh and that's the one that the author is referring to uh, over here. This is the one that the author rahimahullah is referring to. Then the author said الْمَعْرِفَةُ الْأَحْكَامَ الشَّرْعِيَّةَ الْعَمَلِيَّةَ he said, بِأَدِلَّتِهَا huh? بِأَدِلَّتِهَا بِأَدِلَّتِهَا Adilla means evidence. And the evidences are two types. The evidences are what? 
The evidences are two types. Specific evidences and generic evidence. Or general evidence. Specific evidence is al-adilla al-juz'iyya, ama adilla tu-tafsiliyya. Adilla tu-tafsiliyya means that it only talks about a specific issue and nothing other than that. For example, Allah says, وَالْوَالِدَاتُ يُرْضِعْنَ أَوْلَادَهُنَّ حُولَيْنِ كَامِلَيْنِ لِمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يُتِمَّ الرَّضَعَ This ayah is talking about that the mother breastfeeds her child for two complete years. This is a adilla tafsir. It's specific to breastfeeding for two years. That's all it's talking about. You can't use this for ayah in wudu. You can't use this ayah in salah. You, could, you can't use this ayah regarding hajj. You can't. It's restricted to what? Muddat al What's the duration of breastfeeding? And the fact that the mother is breastfeeding. Also, for example, إذا تبايع الرجلان If two individuals are buying and selling from one another فكل واحد both of them they have what? منهما بالخيار They have a choice. ما لم يتفرقا as long as they don't depart from one another. If two people are buying and selling from one another they both have a choice. They both have a what? They both have a choice. As long as they don't go their separate ways. Pay attention here. This hadith is used for what? It's specifically used for إثباتو to affirm خيار المجلس. You can only affirm in this hadith the concept of خيار المجلس. That I have a choice to go back on my... Uh, I can go back on my words as long as I'm in the gathering or as long as I'm in the place of buying. Okay? Does that make sense? So this is adilla tafsiliya. It's restricted to a specific thing. And the reason why the scholars they use the word tafsiliya is because tafsiliya here means it only clarifies a particular thing for you. It only shines light to a particular thing for you. Because you know the word tafsiliya is sometimes but the word tafsiliya in the Arabic language sometimes it comes as a clarification. As Allah said in the ayah, وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ أي نبينها, We clarify it. And like that, we clarify the verses. نُفَصِّلْ أي نبين, We clarify it. So that's what it's used for. So these evidences, they clarify for you a particular issue. The second type is adilla إجمالية, Generic evidence. That's the second type of evidence. And the Shaykh, which one did he specifically choose? Adilla tafsiliya, that's what fiqh deals with. Fiqh does not deal with adilla ijmaliya, generic evidence. And we're not going to talk about that. We're going to speak about adilla ijmaliya when we define usul al fiqh together. So let me type, let me go on this, let me go back on the definition of fiqh one more time. I said that the word ma'rifa, two things fall under it. What are the two things? A, al ilmu, knowledge. And two, al dhannu, speculation. So ma'rifa to know fiqh is in two ways. You can know fiqh in how many ways? Two ways. The first way is an yakuna qat'iyan that is clear cut. And the second one is an yakuna dhaniyan. It's through speculation. That which is known through clear cut, I said for example, is wujubu salawat al khams. The five daily prayers that they are obligatory. Okay? The second one is an yakuna dhaniyan that is based upon ev- uh, speculation. That is like wujub niyati lil wudu' ama fil wudu'i. That the intention is it needed for the wudu' or not? Ama wujub zakati fil asal. Do you have to pay zakat from the honey? This is all what? It is uh, uh, dhani, speculation. Then I said to you that the Sheikh said al ahkam al shariya Why did the Sheikh not just say Ma'rifatul Al-Ahkam? The reason is because Ahkam is four types. He wanted to narrow it down to a particular Ahkam that it deals with Fiqh because Fiqh doesn't deal with the other three. What does it deal with only? One of the four, which is Ahkam al shariya 
But then the ahkam of shari'iyah is divided also in what? Into two. So he restricted it for you even more. What did he say? al amaliyah So you don't think it's what? al ilmiyah al ilmiyah is aqidah. So he said al amaliyah to get rid of that. And then he mentioned bi adillatiha at tafsiliya And he didn't just say bi adillatiha and left it like that. The reason is because the evidences are two types. Specific and general. So he narrowed it down here in his definition as what? Adilla tafsiliya, the specific evidence. Okay? Now we're going to go into, inshallah ta'ala, the definition of usul al fiqh together. The author then says, Athaniyu, the second. What does he mean here by second? The author here means by second, the second type of definition of usul al fiqh. The first type was what? Bi'atibari mufradihi. Defining it separately, usul and fiqh. We've done that now. We've defined usul linguistically and technically. We've defined fiqh linguistically and technically. We now want to go into usul al fiqh together. What does it mean? So the author says, الثاني باعتبار كونه لقبا لهذا الفن المعين فيعرف بأنه علم يبحث عن أدلة الفقه الإجمالية You can say علم يبحث or you can say علم يبحث عن أدلة الفقه الإجمالية وكيفية الاستفادة منها وحال المستفيد فالمراد بقولنا الإجمالية القواعد العامة مثل قولهم الأمر للوجوب والنهي للتحريم والصحة تقتضي النفوذ فخرج به الأدلة التفصيلية فلا تذكر في أصول الفقه إلا على سبيل التمثيل للقاعدة والمراد بقولنا وكيفية الاستفادة منها معرفة كيف يستفيد الأحكام من أدلتها بدراسة أحكام الألفاظ ودلالاتها من عموم وخصوص وإطلاق وتقييد وناسخ ومنسوخ وغير ذلك فإنه بإدراكه يستفيد من أدلة الفقه أحكامها المراد بقولنا وحال المستفيد معرفة حال المستفيد وهو المجتهد سمي مستفيدا لأنه يستفيد بنفسه الأحكام من أدلتها لبلوغه مرتبة الاجتهاد فمع فمعرفة, فمعرفة المجتهد وشروط الاجتهاد وحكمه ونحو ذلك يبحث في أصول الفقه Secondly, with regards to it being a label for this particular science then it is defined as a knowledge where the evidences of fiqh are determined in general and how they are to be benefited from and the condition of the beneficiary. The meaning of the word generality, al ijmaliya is general rules, such as the saying commanding indicates obligation and forbidding indicates prohibition, and good health requires that whatever has to be implemented be implemented. So from this definition, we can exclude specific evidences as they are not mentioned in the Sul of Fiqh except by the way of giving an example for the rule. The meaning of the words and how to make full use of them is knowledge of how to allow the rulings to make full use of the evidences by studying the words and the implications, distinguishing the general from the specific, the restricted from the unrestricted and the abrogated from the abrogating and other than that. So by virtue of, the, of his insight and the faqih can benefit from the evidences of fiqh and the rulings. The meaning of the words condition of the beneficiary is the beneficiary is a mujtahid then he is so if the beneficiary is a mujtahid then he is named as such due to his benefiting from the evidences because he has reached a level of mujtahid. So knowledge of the mujtahid and the conditions of ijtihad and its rulings return to usul al-fiqh. The author here, he defined usul al-fiqh as a subject. He defined it together. Usul al-fiqh together. What does it mean? And this definition that the author gave is close to the definition of al-Baydawi. The Shaykh's definition here is really similar to the def- de- uh, definition that was given by al baydawi in his Minhaj al-Wusul. He said, Dala'il al-Fiqh al-Ijmaliya wa kayfiyatu al-Istifadati minah wa halu al-Mustafid. He said, Dala'il al-Fiqh al-Ijmaliya. Whereas Ibn Uthaymin said, Ilmun yubhathu an adillat al-Fiqh al-Ijmaliya. So they are the same after that onward. Wa kayfiyatu al-Istifadati minah wa halu al-Mustafid. So the Sheikh benefited from him in that regard. And the Sheikh's one is actually even better. Rahimahullah, Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin's one is better. Anyways, the Shaykh mentioned three jumal, three sentences 
of what usul al-fiqh is. If somebody was to ask you what is usul al-fiqh, it is these three sentences. Number one, ilmun yubhathu an adillati al-fiqh al-ijmaliya. You can say ilmun yubhathu, or you can say ilmun yabhathu an adillati al-fiqh al-ijmaliya. Usul al-fiqh, it researches. Or you can say, in usul al-fiqh, it's researched. So if you say yubhathu means it is researched in usul al-fiqh. If you say ilmun yabhathuna, it means usul al-fiqh researches. The subject does the researching. So we can take whichever of those we want. It's a science where in it you're going to research adillatul fiqh al-ijmaliyah. If you remember just a couple of minutes ago, I mentioned that the evidences are how many? Two types. I said that there are specific evidence and there are general evidence. The specific evidence, fiqh deals with it. And it's dealt with in fiqh. لكن أدلة التفصيلية So أدلة الإجمالية General evidence, أصول الفقه deals with it. It's very important that you understand that. And that's the first sentence and the first difference between fiqh and usul al-fiqh. That is, usul al-fiqh researches, looks into generic, general evidences. For instance, al-qira'atu shadha hujja. The qira'a which is shadha is a proof. That's a general evidence. That's a what? General evidence. You can use that in a lot of places. It's general. For example, a hadith al-mursal laysa bi hujjah. The hadith which is mursal is not a proof, for instance. Or al-amru, the command, al-mutlaq, the unrestricted command. Hey, yaqtadi al-wujub, it benefits, it necessitates obligation. Those are general evidences. Why are they general evidences? You can use the term al-amru yaqtadi al-wujub al-amru al-mutlaq yaqtadi al-wujub You can use that in fiqh uh, Sorry, you can use that in tahara You can use that in wudu Sorry, you can use that in salah, sorry You can use that in zakat You can use that in song You can use that in hajj You can use that in every chapter of fiqh It's general Whereas wal-walidat yurdu'na awladahunna hawlayni kamilayni liman arada an yutimma al-rada'a You can't use that in, in tahara You can't use that in salah you can't use that in Hajj. It's a dilla tafsiliya. It's specific to muddat al the period of breastfeeding, and that it's only two years. So, wal amru al mutlaq yaqtadi al wujub, wal amru al mutlaq yaqtadi al wujub, can be used for salah, it can be used for Hajj, it can be used for Ramadan, it can be used for Tahara, because this is a dilla ijmaliya. It's a general evidence. It's not a dilla tafsiliya, it's not specific. The author here, he said, عِلْمٌ يُبْحَثُ عَنْ أَدِلَّةِ الْفِقْءِ الْإِجْمَالِيَّةِ So Usul al-Fiqh, what does it discuss? What does Usul al-Fiqh research? It researches comprehensive evidence, general evidence. So Adilla tafsiliya has nothing to do with Usul al-Fiqh. has nothing to do with Usul al-Fiqh. But the scholars, they do mention أدلة تفصيلية in أصول الفقه for one of two reasons. Sometimes the scholars will mention أدلة تفصيلية in أصول الفقه but they will only be doing that for one of two reasons. The first one is التمثيل. They want to use it as an example. They want to use this specific evidence for an example. Example for what? Example to clarify this principle that they brought forward to clarify it for you and to make it clearer for you to understand. The second is They want to prove that this has evidence, has a proof. So they bring for it a dilla tafsiliya to prove it. For example, they will say الأمر المطلق يقتضي الوجوب and then they will mention the ayah وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ عِدَّةٍ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ They would use that. 
Why are they using it? They want to show you that Al-Amr Al-Mutlaq Yaqtadi Al-Wujub has an evidence from the Qur'an. Or for example, they would say Al-Nahi Al-Mutlaq Yaqtadi Al-Tahreem. And then they would bring the evidence Man Ahdata Fi Amrina Hada Ma Laysa Minhu Fawarad. They would use that. The second jumla, the second sentence that Usul al-Fiqh, uh, that the Shaykh Rahimahullah mentioned in the definition of Usul al-Fiqh is وَكَيْفِيَّةُ الْإِسْتِفَادَةِ مِنْهَا How to benefit from the comprehensive evidence. And what this means is the method and the methodology and the way that a person extracts jurisprudent rulings from the textual evidence. And that's called istimbat. And the istimbat, for somebody to do istimbat, it stands on two pillars. Istimbat actually stands on two great pillars. The first one is ma'rifatu al-dalalat al The person knows the, the linguistic terms and their indications of what are in it. The meaning that is in these terms that are used in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. The person has to have understanding of dalalatul al-fad, the indications that are in the words, the meaning that can be taken from these terms. Do they show generalization? Do they show specification? Do these terms show us that this thing is unrestricted or that it's restricted? Does it show us that um, uh, this is abrogated or this is not abrogated? This is called ma'rifatu dalalati al-lughawiyya. The person has to know that. To do istimbaq, you would need to have that. The second pillar that it stands on is ma'rifatu al-ilali wal ma'ani shar'iyya. The person has to know the reasonings and the, uh, the Islamic meaning behind terms. Because some terms, they have a haqiqa shar'iyya. The sharia has coined a definition for this word. The person has to know that. They also have to know the reasons and the ilal in which the sharia are mentioned. All of that terms, we're going to speak about it in great details, what it means, al-ilal, and the reality of the term, al-illa, uh, and the word sabab. Are they the same? And do they mean the same? And, and there are there differences between the two? We will be talking about that, inshallah ta'ala. The third jumla, the third sentence in the definition of usul al-fiqh was, wahal al-mustafid. Hal al-mustafid is um, knowing the mujtahid. Knowing the, ind- the person who is a mujtahid. Who is a mujtahid? The mujtahid is the one who benefits from the textual evidence directly. He can go to the Quran and the Sunnah directly himself and benefit from these terms. Why can he benefit from it? Because he has ma'rifatu, ma'rifatu dalalat al And he also has ma'rifatu al-ilal wal ma'ani al-shar'iyya. He has those two pillars to do istimbat of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So he's a mujtahid. He's a mujtahid. So usul al-fiqh, it talks about mabahith al-ijtihad. It talks about what a mujtahid is. And what is a taqlid, a person who blind follows. Now, scholars, they say, ijtihad and taqlid are min mukammilat ilm usul al-fiqh. They complete usul al-fiqh. But they, have, they don't have nothing to do with usul al-fiqh. They're not from the essence of what usul al-fiqh is. It just, it's a side benefit to study. It's not actually what usul al-fiqh is. Usul al-fiqh really is a dillatul ijmaliyya and it's kayfiyatul istifadati minha. It is knowing the general textual evidences and how to benefit from them. And how to benefit from them means what? Ma'rifatu dalalati al-alfad. Learning the terms that are used in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and how they are. Now, inshallah ta'ala, I want to point out something very important, which is, the author, he called his book, Usul, Al-Usul, he called his book, Al-Usul min ilmi, min ilmi al-Usul. What is the difference between the first Usul and the second Usul that's mentioned in the name of the book? Al-Usul min ilmi al-Usul. What's the difference between the two Usuls? The, fir- the difference between it is that the first Usul, is the linguistic meaning. And the second usul is the 
one that we just defined here, which is ilmun yubhathu an adillati al-fiqh al-ijmaliyya wa kayfiyyati al-istifadati minna wa halu al-mustafid. Wa halu al-mustafid. That definition of usul al-fiqh is what the second usul is for the author when he called the name book al-usul min al-usul. The word al-usul, the first usul, is the linguistic meaning. What was the linguistic meaning of the word al-usul? It meant That's what he means. And the second one is the technical meaning of usul al-fiqh, which is علم يبحث عن أدلة الفقه الإجمالية وكيفية الاستفادة منها وحال المستفيد. Now we're going to go into the another portion of what the author says. He says فائدة أصول الفقه إن أصول الفقه علم جليل القدر بالغ الأهمية عزيز الفائدة. فائدة التمكن من حصول قدرة يستطيع بها المجتهد استخراج الأحكام الشرعية من أدلتها على أسس سليمة. هي إسيس التمكن من حصول قدرة يستطيع بها المجتهد. This word المجتهد it's not present in the طبعة التي أشرفت عليها مؤسسة الشيخ. The مؤسسة of the شيخ مؤسسة الشيخ محمد صالح عثيمين. They did mention the word المجتهد. They didn't mention that term. But if you look at the Taba'a of Al-Ma'ahid Al-Ilmiya that published the book as well, they put the word Al-Mujtahidu in there. And it's better to put the word Al-Mujtahidu in there. Now. The benefits of jurisprudence. Usul al-fiqh is a noble science of the utmost importance, immensely rewarding by which one is able to obtain a capacity to extract legal rulings from evidences on a sound footing. So Usul al-fiqh is a very important science. وَلِذَلِكَ Any individual who wants to use evidence in the Qur'an or the Sunnah, the scholars, they say that they need two things. Number one, you need, you need نص مصدق and بحث محقق. Number one, you need to be using something that's authentic. You have to check the authenticity. If it's Qur'an, you can't use قراءة شاذة. Okay? If we take the opinion of those who say that it cannot be used as evidence. Okay. Second one is, you can't be using weak narrations from the Prophet ﷺ. It has to be a hadith, a sahiha, that meet the conditions of authenticity. So that's the first condition, to be using evidence. That is studied in what subject? Mustalah al-Hadith. Mustalah al-Hadith is the science that studies that and talks about what is authentic and what isn't authentic, what is accepted and what is rejected. The second condition for using evidence is you have to learn the relationship between the evidence that you brought to the table and the thing that you're using the evidence for. Okay? So you're not trying to say this is halal and you're trying to say my evidence is this. You would have to prove to us that you're able to bring from the hadith or the ayah that you brought the permissibility for whatever you're trying to use it for. That is taught in what? That is taught in Usul al-Fiqh. Like for example, somebody might say, I can celebrate the Prophet's birthday. Hey, what's your evidence that you can celebrate the Prophet's birthday? And then he goes to you, أَفَلَا يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبِلِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ That's my evidence that you can celebrate the Prophet's birthday. Why do you not go out there and look at the camel? That's my evidence. And so then you say to them, but how does this evidence prove that you can celebrate the Prophet's birthday? And he said, on the Prophet's celebration, we eat camels. Camel meat. You can clearly see that this person lacks the ability of what? This person lacks the ability of using a delil for the madlul. For whatever he wants to use it for. He's trying to use it for the argument of the Prophet's birthday can be celebrated. But he's bringing a delil that doesn't, doesn't prove that. So those are the two things that a person needs if he's using an evidence. First of all, he has to verify that it's authentic. Second thing that he needs to do is that he has to make sure that he's got the ability to show that this evidence proves his argument. Usul al-fiqh does the second, or the latter of the two. And that's why it's very important to study this science. It's ilmun jalilul qadri, as the author said. It's a very noble science. And it has what? Baligul ahamiyya. And it has great importance. Azizul fa'idah. 
أما غزير الفائدة its benefits are vast غزير الفائدة means the benefits are very vast and the author then says the benefits he just mentioned one benefits which is التمكن من حصول قدرة يستطيع بها المجتهد استخراج الأحكام الشرعية من أدلة على أسس أسس سليمة the person can extract from the أحكام الشرعية meaning from the Quran and the Sunnah he is able to extract from there evidences in a what على أسس سليمة based upon sound foundation you won't see that person contradicting themselves some people the problem with them is they would use a evidence a in one issue and then they are going against it in another fatwa that they gave that person what you see from them is that they don't know usul al-fiqh or that they are contradicting themselves a person who studied usul al-fiqh and is grounded in the science will not fall into that he or she will not fall into that. And many other scholars have given other benefits of studying usul al-fiqh. Then the author then says, وَأَوَّلُ مَنْ جَمَعَهُ كَفَنٍ مُسْتَقِلٍ الْإِمَامْ الشَّافِعِي مُحَمَّدِ بْنُ إِدْرِيسِ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ تَابَعَهُ الْعُلَمَاءِ فِي ذَلِكَ فألفوا فيه التآليف المتنوعة ما بين منثور ومنظوم ومختصر ومبسوط حتى صار فن المستقل له كيانه ومميزاته the first person to make this an independent science was Imam al-Shafi'i Muhammad ibn Idris. Then many other scholars followed him in that and authored many books, which ranged from prose, poetry, and brief and long volumes until it became an entity in its own right with discernible features. The author here, rahimahullah, said something very powerful. He said, وَأَوَّلُ مَنْ جَمَعَهُ كَفَنٍ مُسْتَقِلٍ The first person who had written it as a independent subject, an independent science. And that's very important because Usul al-Fiqh did exist before. It actually did exist. At the time of the Sahabas, they had Usul al-Fiqh and it was present. And they used to use it in their verdicts, in their judgments between people. And they took this from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the students of the companions took it from them. And it carried on like that. So Usul al-Fiqh was present at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. It was present at the time of the Sahabas. And it was present at the time of the Tabi'een. Lakin, but it wasn't present as a subject independent that was studied. That is referred to as Usul al-Fiqh. That didn't exist. That didn't exist. And the person who wrote it as a fannin mustaqil, an independent science, that has its weights, that has its rules, that has its regulations, that has its um, uh, content, and it has its... was Al Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, who died the year 204 Hijriyyah. He died the year 204 Hijriyyah, and he was born 150 Hijriyyah. He was 54 years of age, rahimahullah ta'ala. He was the one who wrote in Usul al-Fiqh, wa lidharika the poet, he said, وأول من ألف في الكتب محمد بن شافع المطلب وغيره كان له سليقة مثل الذي للعرب من خليقة. The first person who wrote into this, who wrote about this science and spoke about it and authored in it is Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i وغيره كان له سليقة. And other than him, meaning the other scholars before Shafi'i, it was for them سليقة. It was was natural. Usul al-fiqh was natural. They didn't have to be told that this term is general and this term is specific and this word shows generalization and this word doesn't show generalization. They didn't need that because they were Arabs and they understood these terms. Like in Imam al-Shafi'i, he wrote it as a subject and he wrote it twice. Rahimahullah. He wrote one called Al-Risalatu al baghdadiyya which is Mafquda. It was lost. And some of the things that were mentioned in the Risalatul Baghdadiyya that was written in Baghdad, some of those statements are present in books. Like Ibn Salah transmits some of the statements of Imam Shafi'i from his Risala al Baghdadiyya. He transmits from him Ibn Salah and Bayhaqi and Nawawi and Ibn Al Qayyim and Zarqashi and others. They transmitted some of his statements in that book. But the whole entire book is lost. 
like in the one he wrote in Egypt, which is called Al Risalatul Misriya. That one is present, it is Matbu'u Muhaqqaqa Tahqiqan Ilmiyan Rafi'a. It was well looked after, it was worked on greatly, and it was edited properly. And it was done by the great Imam, Al Imam Ahmed Shakir Rahimahullah. He didn't Tahqiq. A very good tahqiq on that book. Worked very hard. And scholars have said that Ahmed Shakir's best tahqiq of a book is Ar Risala. He, that w was the best he did. And now, recently, uh, another man, uh, he did a tahqiq on the kitab. His name is called Mahir Yasin Al Fahl, who is from uh, Iraq. He did tahqiq of the kitab, but I um, haven't managed to read it properly yet. I have the Risala by Mahir one, but I haven't been able to read that one. I've read the one by Ahmed Shakir, rahimahullah ta'ala. Why did Allah wa ta'ala make it possible for Al Imam Shafi'i to precede everybody else in writing in Usul al Fiqh or to compile or to be the first person to write in this subject? What were the reasons? So the scholars they mention. Three things supported Al Imam al Shafi'i to surpass everybody, to precede everybody in writing in Usul al Fiqh. The first one is Inayatuhu, the hard work and the effort that Al Imam al Shafi'i gave to Bi Nusus al Kitab al Sunnah. How much time and effort he gave to the Quran and the Sunnah, Al Imam al Shafi'i rahimahullah. And Ismail ibn Yahya al Muzani mentioned that Shafi'i memorized the Quran. Shafi'i Muzari said that Shafi'i said to him, Hafiztu al Quran, I memorized the Quran, wa ala ibn sab'a sinin. I was only seven years old. Wa hafiztu al Muwatta, and I memorized the Muwatta by Al Imam Al Imam al Nawawi, Al Imam Malik ibn Anas. I memorized Al Imam Malik's Muwatta, wa ala ibn Ashra sinin. I was only ten years of age. Al Rabi' ibn Sulaiman al Muradi, another student of Al Imam al Shafi'i, said, Qallama little. دخلت على الشافعي دعا أنت دفن الإمام الشافعي إلا والقرآن بين يديه except that I found the Quran was in front of him. يتتبع آيات الأحكام. He would follow and look into the آيات الأحكام. Would look into the آيات الأحكام. The uh, آيات in the Quran that you can take from them jurisprudential rulings. الإمام الشافعي would look at it a lot and go over it again and again in order to get أحكام out of it. So that's what helped him a lot. And he was one person who gave very great importance to the Quran like that. And he gave also importance to the Sunnah. He was Mu'adhimu Ahadith al Ahkam. He honored and he venerated Ahadith al Ahkam. And he would rarely go against a Hadith, an Imam al Shafi'i, if he came his way. If he came his way, he would never go against it. And the fact that he memorized the Muwatta of an Imam Malik shows you his love and his passion for. Uh, hadith al ahkam and there's a story that ibn hajar rahimahullah mentioned ibn hajar mentioned in his kitab tawali ta'sis li ma'rifati muhammad ibn idris he wrote a story uh, amazing story that happened to the mother of al-imam shafi'i which is she came to a judge a qadi a judge in mecca her and another woman shafi'i's mother and another woman, Shafi'i's mother's friend, they both came to a qadi, a judge. And they wanted to judge the qadi to judge them from a claim that they had against a particular man. So the qadi wanted to verify the validity of what the mother of Shafi'i was claiming and the other woman. So what he said was, I'm going to separate you both and I'm going to ask you both questions and I'm going to see if your story, uh, you two story, uh, it's, for, it's resembles one another or if your story goes together. So Shafi'i's mother said, no. She said to him, Laysa laka dalik. you have no rights to do that. And then she read the ayah, أَن تَضِلَّ إِحْدَاهُمَا فَتُذَكِّرَ إِحْدَاهُمَا الْأُخْرَى the ayah mentions that if one of the women re forgets it and she's unable to re recall the situation or the reality of the matter, then the other one is meant to come and to remind her. 
So Allah is saying, فَتُذَكِّرْ إِحْدَاهُمَ الْأُخْرَى One is reminding the other. So you can't separate us. Then the Qadi came back and he looked at who this woman was and he found out that it was the mother of Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah. So that's Shafi'i's mother, Ibn Hajar said. Imagine Shafi'i himself. The second thing that helped Imam Shafi'i to, to surpass everybody else in writing in Usul al-Fiqh was because tamakkunu. He was grounded in Ma'rifat al-Lughat al-Arab. He was grounded in the Arabic language. He was an Imam in the language. Rahimahullah ta'ala. وَلِذَلِكَ إِذَا نَطَقَ بِكَلِمَةٍ If Shafi'i actually uttered a word, uh, the scholars عُدَّتْ They considered it مِنْ كَلَامِ الْعَرَبِ الفصيح. They would say this is an Arabic term and it can be used like this. And they used his, his speech a proof. وَلِذَلِكَ We mentioned this many times. Imam al-Asba'i Rahimahullah Abdul Malik ibn Quraib al-Asba'i He said that I sat down and I wrote the poetry, um, I corrected the poetry of the people of Hudayl from Imam Shafi'i. And the people of Hudayl was the people that Imam Shafi'i went to when he left, the, when he went to the outskirts of Mecca to learn Arabic from. So Abdul Malik ibn Quraib, Imam min Aymat al lugha he's an Imam in the language. He said, I sat with Shafi'i and I corrected some of the poetry of the people of Hudayl from Imam Shafi'i's memory. The third thing that helped an Imam Shafi'i to surpass everybody else in, in writing in this subject is the gift Allah gave him subhanahu wa ta'ala and how he was, he was gifted as an individual. He was a person who was mutawaqqid with dhihn. He was very alert, rahimahullah. And he was qawiyu al-qariha, haadu al-dhaka, sharp, very smart, very clever. He had strong memory. That helped him, rahimahullah, rahmatan wasi'a. And he was a person who studied greatly sciences that had nothing to do even with the Sharia. And Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he studied psychology, ilm al firasa, psychology. He stayed in Yemen to study psychology. Walidalika, he knew how to read people, rahimahullah, rahmatan wasi'a. The reason why Shafi'i wrote in this subject, Usul al-Fiqh, uh, he wrote the Kitab al-Risala, was that Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi commanded him, he commanded, he instructed him to write in it. And Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi died when the year was 198 Hijriya. 198 Hijriya. Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi commanded and he instructed uh, al-Imam al-Shafi'i to write uh, in this field. First of all, he commanded him to write in Ma'ani al-Qur'an, the meanings of the Qur'an. And in there he compiled the accepting of the Akbar al-Ahad, that it can be accepted and that the Ijma' is a hujja and that the Nasiq and the Mansukh from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, what are they, and things like that. But the Imam Shafi'i straight away, he didn't jump on it. I mean, he didn't do it straight away. So Ali ibn al-Madini, who died in 234 Hijriya, who Al-Imam al Al-Bukhari, Rahimahullah, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, he said, Mastasgartu nafsi, I never belittled myself, Abama Ahadin, in the presence of anybody, the way that I belittled myself, in the presence of Ali ibn al-Madini. Ali ibn al-Madini, who died here, 234 Hijriya, he said to Shafi'i, do as Ibn Mahdi is telling you, do as Abdurrahman al-Mahdi is saying, do it, it will be something good. And so he went and he did it, and this book was authored. This book, Al Risala, was authored. Then the Shaykh, Rahimullah, uh, Shaykh Muhammad Salah al Uthaymin, then he said, فَأَلَّفُوا فِيهِ تَأَلِفَ الْمُتَلَوِّعَةِ مَا بَيْنَ مَنْثُورٍ After Imam al Shafi'i died and he passed away, many people came after that and they wrote. And the Shaykh said, مَنْثُورٍ وَمَنْظُومٍ وَمُخْتَصَرٍ وَمَبْسُوطٍ So let's, he mentioned four. We're going to touch on all of those four, what they mean. First of all, the word manthur is the opposite of manthum. Manthur is uh, that which isn't poetry. That which isn't poetry. So some scholars, they wrote it in a, a non-poetic form. And from them is Al-Fusul Fil-Usul by Abi Bakr al-Razi, who died in year 370 Hijriya. Abi Ishaq al-Shirazi, who died in year 476 Hijriya. 
قواطع الأدلة أبي مظفر السمعاني في تاريخ 489 هجرية and المستصفى by أبي حامد الغزالي في تاريخ 505 هجرية other than then have written in 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 non poetic form in منثور poetic it, many scholars write it from them is um, شرف الدين العمريطي في تاريخ 890 هجرية he has a kitab called تسهيل الطرقات لنظم الورقات where he he summarized uh, the nazm of al-imam uh, abi ma'ali al-juwayni he made it into poetry um, and what did he start it started with hamdan liman yusnad kull hamdi ilayhi marfu'an bi ghayri dhas qasaw al-sukar he mentions قال شرف الدين عمري ضد العجز والتقصير والتفريض الحمد لله الذي قد أظهر علم الأصول للوراء وعشرة على لسان الشافعي فهو على لسان الشافعي هونا وهو الذي لو ابتداء دونا وتابعة الناس حتى صار كتبا صغار الحجم أو كبار وخير كتبه الصغار مأسوم للورقات للإمام الحرمي he said something like that so uh, يحيى بن موسى العمريطي he has نظم ورقات also كوكب الساطع by جلال الدين الصيوطي رحمه الله Suyuti, he made into poetry the Jam al Jawami by Subki. He made it into poetry. And it's like 1,500 lines of poetry, taqriban. Uh, Suyuti wrote it, who died in 911. And also Maraqi Su'ud, Limub Taghir Ruqi wa Su'ud, Su'ud, written by Abdullah, Sayyid Abdullah ibn Hajj al Shinqiti, who died in the year 1,230 Hijriya, approximately. He has a kitab called Maraqi Su'ud. يقول عبد الله وهو ارتسم أسما له والعلوي المنتمى. It's a thousand lines of poetry and it's very good. And it's a it's a uh, it's a uh, nadm, a poet poetry made from the Jam al Jawami by Subki. Okay. And to be very honest, when it comes to these sciences, it's always good to memorize the poetries. It will help you a lot. The poet he said, وحرص على المنظوم فهو أسهل. للحفظ من نثر ومنه أجمل وهو لطلاب العلوم أنفع وللفوائد الحسان أجمع من أجل هذا عول الأعلام من أجل هذا عول الأعلام عليه وانبرت له الأقلام. The مختصر that the author mentioned from them is مختصر أبي عمر بن الحاجب who died in 646 هجرية. جمع الجوامع by Subki is a summary from a hundred books of أصول الفقه. جمع الجوامع is a summary of a hundred books of usul al-fiqh. Also the Mukhtasar al-Tahrir by Muhammad ibn Ahmed al-Futuhi who died in 972. What about the Mabsut, the more detailed and not the summarized but detailed books of usul al-fiqh where they go into great details. The best of them is Al-Bahr al-Muhit by Zarkashi. Wal-Tahbir al-Sharh al-Tahriri li Abi al-Hasan Ali ibn Sulaiman al-Mardawiyu who died in the year 885. He has a kitab called uh, Sharh al-Tahrir, where he explains the kitab al-Tahbir. It's also from the Mabsut, the detailed books that are written in Usul al-Fiqh. So those are the books that were written after Imam al-Shafi'i, the Manthur and the Manthum and the Mukhtasim and the Mabsut that I mentioned. The non-poetic books, the poetic books, the summarized books, and also the detailed books. I gave you all of that. And I'm going to inshallah ta'ala conclude there. We've taken an introduction. And the author rahimahullah is going to start al uh, ahkam next uh, in the next chapter. And uh, tomorrow we'll carry on the class. Kareem. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and shaytan. And Allah and his messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. أستغفرك وأتوب إليك